Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth session of uh, our Cox Telementary series. Uh, uh, today's topic is on bleeding in early pregnancy and abortions, and uh, uh, which would be taken by our expert, Dr. Simon Kigondo. Uh, without much uh, Waiting, I would request Dr. Vini to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Vini, over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Lakshmi, and uh, well, everyone, thank, welcome to this session, to the session this evening. Sorry, um, our speaker for the evening is uh, Dr. Simon Kigondu, as we have been told, and uh, the session is on early pregnancy bleeding and abortions. This is our fifth session out of uh, the series that we have of 12 sessions. And uh, Dr. Kigondu, as usual, he's not new to us. He's a consultant obstetrician gynecologist at Exela Healthcare and also the consultant at Kibumo Subcounty Hospital. He's also the chairperson of uh, the Central Branch of uh, Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological Society. And uh, he's the Secretary General of Kenya Medical Association. He's an alumnus of medical school at the University of Nairobi. He's completed uh, his uh, undergraduate training in two, the year 2000 and postgraduate training in the year 2007. He has worked as an obstetrician gynecologist in both public and private sector. And he has previously served as a medical superintendent. He holds a diploma in computer science and he's active in the human rights field. So welcome Dr. Kigondo, uh, take us through the session. Thank you very much. Uh, is my screen visible? Uh, yes. yes, your screen is visible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> Again, I want to welcome all to uh, this uh, Kenya Obstetrical and Gynecological uh, Series. Uh, today being our fifth one, we, um, I will attempt to take you through a very common uh, uh, obstetric and gynecological situation that I am sure all of us have uh, come across and we'll try to see how our different experiences come together. So it's, um, uh, we will cover bleeding in early pregnancy and mainly uh, abortions. Um, early, our definition of early pregnancy is the period of pregnancy, which is prior to fetal viability outside the Kigondo? uterus. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, can you please make it full screen? Otherwise, it would be difficult for okay. people to see. Um, um, there is there is a small cup-like icon to your lower right. Uh, beside, besides the plus and minus sign. Uh, okay. Left, left to that, left to that. A small cup, yeah, yeah, that one. Thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah. Has it come full screen? Yes, sir. Thank you. So early pregnancy is defined as the period of pregnancy, which is prior to fetal viability outside the uterus. As you know, the argument about what is fetal viability uh, differs in different places. Traditionally in Kenya, a fetus that is less than 28 weeks is considered non-viable. The reasons for this are uh, uh, technological uh, abilities of uh, uh, making a fetus that is below 28 weeks survive. My uh, youngest fetus to survive was 26 weeks. So if a fetus is delivered and survives, then it's considered viable. In the United States of America and Australia, they are able to um, have a fetus of 20 weeks survive. So for them, that is viability. And it's defined as a fetal weight of about 
less than 500 grams is what can survive. In other jurisdictions, a fetal viability of 24 weeks is also considered. In these uh, discussions, uh, we are describing more of the spontaneous uh, pregnancy losses and we, uh, the world is moving towards the term miscarriage because the term abortion is generally uh, uh, excites a lot of emotions and considered to be uh, in uh, quote in quotes intentional. So before we go to the main topic of miscarriages, um, there are when a lady comes with early pregnancy bleeding, then we need to look at um, have several possibilities in our minds. The first and foremost, uh, if the lady is pregnant, you are thinking of a miscarriage and all its permutations. The possibility that someone can be bleeding and has an ectopic pregnancy is there. And this is a very important differential for early pregnancy bleeding. People uh, could be bleeding when they are pregnant, when they have gestational tophoblastic disease, which in essence is an abnormal pregnancy. It's also important to consider that local gynecological lesions uh, could cause uh, early pregnancy bleeding, bleeding in early pregnancy. And some of these lesions include uh, lesions of the cervix, such as carcinoma, dysplasia, polyps, and cervicitis. Uh, you can have varicose veins of the vulva and vagina that have ruptured. You can have vaginal and vulval condylomata. And occasionally, inflammation of the vagina caused by infections like candidiasis could also cause early pregnancy bleeding. So it's important to examine a patient thoroughly uh, before concluding that it is a miscarriage or something else. Uh, early pregnancy bleeding is often accompanied by pain in the lower abdomen and other differentials for anexal pain uh, in the lower abdomen, even in pregnancy, could be acute appendicitis, ovarian torsion, and other adnexal tumors. So in the back of the mind, anyone in early pregnancy who comes bleeding, it's important that they you have these other differentials at the back of your mind. Now going to abortions, and we have said the term miscarriages is now the term that we more commonly use. Then it has an overall, uh, the overall miscarriage rate is about 15 to 20%. And the frequency of uh, spontaneous miscarriages increases with maternal age. They say that 80% of miscarriages, if you are to have a miscarriage, 80% of the miscarriage will occur within the first trimester. With that frequency decreasing with increasing gestational age. Another phenomenon called recurrent early pregnancy loss is when you have a loss of two or more pregnancies in uh, early gestation. This affects about 1% of all couples. The early pregnancy is not race dependent. It can occur in any race without discrimination. So what are the causes of early pregnancy bleeding? The embryonic causes, that is uh, miscarriages as a result of a problem in the fetus, occur in 80 to 90% of the first trimester spontaneous miscarriages. Genetic abnormalities within the embryo, that is chromosomal abnormalities, are the most common cause and they constitute about 50 to 65% of all miscarriages. The single most, chromos, single most chromosomal anomaly that is a cause of miscarriages is 45X cardiotype. And uh, maybe I can just hold on there and uh, have uh, in the next 30 seconds, someone type what 45X cardiotype is called in the chat box. Anyone checking the chat box for me? Am, am I able to check the chat box? Yeah. Yes, 
I can see Jacqueline Oire, Hase Tana Syndrome, Duncan Marube, George Oboak. Yes, people are, are uh, very, uh, they are on top of the game. Tana Syndrome. Trisomies are the single largest group of chromosomal anomalies. One half of all anomalies are associated with miscarriage. Trisomy 16 is the most common trisomy found. Approximately 20% of genetic abnormalities are triploidies. These are genetic terms that um, are especially studied in the West. When a miscarriage happens, they take the products of conception and subject them to genetic mapping to see why did this miscarriage come. In the next uh, many years, uh, then we, we will reach there as Kenyans. Teratogenic and mutagenic factors are also known to cause miscarriages. So when um, a mother wants to know why did I have a miscarriage, then you can have a list of possibilities of what the causes of miscarriages are. And I'm sure a lot of the times mothers do want to know what the, their cause of their miscarriages, of their miscarriage is. Uh, that's just a picture of what uh, I just put it there for what some of those um, uh, what some people may hear uh, trisomies and chromosomal abnormalities. Just uh, a snapshot of these are the 46 chromosomes on the left side. We have chromosome one to 46 and you can see what 45 XO means. It means there is no Y chromosome. If you look at the picture on the right, uh, taken from the science photo library, then you have all the chromosomes. And here you have the XY as opposed to the picture on the left. And, uh, but of importance is that the chromosome number 16 are three. That is what is termed as trisomy 16, just to get a picture of what these chromosomal abnormalities are. So other causes of uh, miscarriages include maternal causes. They could be genetic, as we have alluded to earlier, maternal age may be directly related to what is called a nuploid, like over 30% of the people above 40 years. Couples with recurrent miscarriages also have a 2 to 3% incidence of parental chromosomal anomalies, that is balanced translocations. Uh, that is, again, the genetic component of it. You now can go and get structural abnormalities of the reproductive tract. For instance, if you have the uterus that has congenital defects, like if there is a, a uterine septum, yeah, a dividing band inside the uterus, this can lead to miscarriages. Some people with fibroids may, fibroids may be actually, uh, may, uh, lead to uh, some miscarriages. And uh, a second trimester and third trimester uh, pregnancy losses can be attributed to cervical incompetence. Um, corpus luteum deficiency uh, or what is called progesterone deficiency can lead to miscarriages at about eight to 12 weeks. We know that progesterone or the component called HSG is what maintains uh, the pregnancies early on before the placenta is fully developed. And if there's a deficiency in that, that could result in miscarriages. Uh, active infections, uh, they've mentioned torches here, but the main um, uh, sort of infection that may lead to miscarriages is uh, one of brucella. And one of the uh, brucella is called brucella aborta. And uh, that was as a result of miscarriages in animals, and it could lead to miscarriages in uh, human beings. And of course, an acute fever, trauma, of course, if someone uh, is, uh, uh, gets trauma, then that could lead to a miscarriage. Other chronic maternal health factors that could be associated with miscarriages include the endocrine clauses like polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. So it's important that uh, the sugar control in diabetes mellitus is tight to prevent uh, miscarriages. Untreated thyroid disease could also attenuate the risks of 
miscarriages, renal disease. Then you have immunological causes such as systemic lupus, erythematosus, those are maternal diseases, severe hypertension, and a condition uh, of, uh, related to immunology that is called the famously called antiphospholipid syndrome that has been associated with miscarriages. Other factors that are associated uh, with miscarriages include uh, excessive tobacco, excessive alcohol, um, drugs of abuse like co cocaine, very high doses of caffeine, and other independent risk factors for spontaneous miscarriage. So extremes of age, uh, there are talks of nervousness, stress, psychological conditions, and over fatigue. But these are not too um, uh, directly, so to speak, related to miscarriages, but they have been associated with that. So uh, when you have symptoms of vaginal bleeding, but not abdominal pain, that these are associated with an increased risk of miscarriage by 50%. A gestational exposure to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may also risk, uh, may also uh, have an increased risk for miscarriages. Obesity increases the likelihood of spontaneous abortion, with the risk being highest in the first two months of pregnancy. All these risk factors help us to point to how we can help prevent miscarriages, like obesity, avoid obesity avoiding exposure to NSAIDs and uh, stuff like that. So we go, we delve in now to the uh, sort of the pathophysiology, what we commonly uh, see associated with miscarriages. And generally um, it can be put the four stages of a spontaneous miscarriage, although the miscarriage process is a continuum. The processes can be divided into what is commonly called four stages of threatened, inevitable, incomplete, and complete. I'm sure majority of us have come across these terms over and over again. So a combination of oxidative stress, a more hypoxic environment, and defective placentation may lead to increased serum ischemia modified albumin, also called IMA. Now those are some details of science concentrations, which in turn may play a role in the pathophysiology of early pregnancy loss. So uh, just uh, going through the, the, the four types of uh, abortion or miscarriage, so to speak, you have a threatened, uh, this table sort of would be a summary of the talk today. And uh, if you have you, the characteristics of uh, bleeding, colicky pain, cervical dilatation, uterine size, products of conception, shock, and a pregnancy test would uh, sort of summarize, uh, be a snapshot of this particular topic. So in a threatened miscarriage, you'll have bleeding, but it's not too much. Inevitable may have more bleeding and incomplete. Complete um, uh, miscarriage may have a bleeding similar to a threatened, and a missed miscarriage may or may not have bleeding. Colicky pain occurs more in inevitable and incomplete. Uh, so you have that pain that is in the lower abdomen that is colicky. The cervical dilatation, by definition, occurs in inevitable uh, miscarriage and incomplete uh, miscarriage. You'll have the cervix that is closed in threatened, complete, and missed. The uterine size uh, would co correspond to uh, the amenorrhea in threatened and in inevitable, because you still have the products of conception inside. And an incomplete miscarriage may be slightly smaller than the expected amenorrhea period. And incomplete and missed may be smaller and even going back to the normal size because of um, the shrinking of the products of conception or them not being there. Products of conception would be present in, uh, in, uh, on vaginal examination in uh, incomplete and complete. In threatened and inevitable, the products of conception may not have come out. A 
patient may be in shock, in inevitable and incomplete miscarriages. Uh, and a pregnancy test is normally positive for all this, but may be negative in a missed miscarriage. So in a picturesque way, when you're looking at this picture borrowed from Dr. Sawad Abd El Salam, then you see that in the first picture, you have a threatened miscarriage. I, I, I think we will go through the characteristic of it all. Note that the uh, products of conception are in situ and the cervix is closed. In an inevitable miscarriage, you still have the products of conception and the cervix is open. And in an incomplete miscarriage, the fetal uh, part may have come out, but you still have products of conception in situ. And in a missed miscarriage, the products of conception may still be in situ, but will have shrunken uh, um, a lot by the time. So keep this picture in mind as we are continuing through the uh, description. So when uh, you get someone with the early pregnancy bleeding, you would want to do a pelvic exam. You would want to know the source of the bleeding. Therefore, you have to look from bottom up, literally. You check, uh, is the bleeding coming from the cervical os? How much is the intensity of bleeding? Are we bleeding actively? Are we in clot? Is there any uh, passage of tissue? And uh, you'd want to know whether the cervical motion uh, tenderness, you remember that if you have an ectopic pregnancy, then you would get cervical motion tenderness. Cervical os, you want to check if it's closed, which is a characteristic of complete or threatened, or if it's open, which is a characteristic of inevitable or incomplete. You want to assess the uterine size and uh, whether there is pain over the uterus. You're looking for suspicious masses on the adnexa. The adnexa is on the sides of the uh, uterus you are, uh, because you want to rule out, you don't want to miss an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, someone who comes with early pregnancy bleeding, you do a hemogram because you want to get the, uh, what is the hemoglobin, what, uh, uh, what is the platelet count because you're looking at uh, bleeding tendencies. Beta HCG is a pregnancy test. It can either be urine or blood. You want to group and cross match in case that uh, you need to know. Uh, sorry, group and cross match is important because even in miscarriages, people with recess negative, you'd want to give anti-D in case uh, they have uh, the miscarriage. You want to see a coagulation profile because some people come bleeding uh, due to bleeding tendencies. And you want to do a urinalysis. UTIs occasionally may stimulate uh, miscarriages. An ultrasound of the pelvis would be useful. And um, the importance of it is to have uh, to see whether the products of conception are viable or non-viable. So the sonographers have features uh, of viability, a crown ramp length of more than seven millimeters and no heartbeat would mean that it's non-viable. A mean sac diameter of over 25 millimeters and absence of an embryo is non-viable. The absence of an embryo with a heartbeat for more than two weeks following a rescan that initially showed a gestational sac with no yolk sac, that's non-viable. And the absence of an embryo with a heartbeat over 11 days following a scan that showed a gestational sac with a yolk sac, that's non-viable. So what is a threatened miscarriage? The definition is any vaginal bleeding during eye pregnancy without, and that's the hallmark, without cervical dilatation or a change in cervical consistency. And this would be, normally be the entry point of anyone coming with early pregnant, pregnancy bleeding. Usually there is no significant pain, <clears throat> although the client may have mild cramps. Threatened miscarriage occurs in 25 to 30% of all pregnancies. You may get either blood or a brownish discharge that may be present in the vagina. And the cervix is non-tender and closed. There are no fetal tissues or membranes that have been passed or reported to have been passed. And an ultrasound shows a continuing intrauterine pregnancy. 
I think this is clear. Um, what is the prognosis of a threatened miscarriage? There are reasonable chances for continuing a pregnancy when you have that early pregnancy loss and you have diagnosed a threatened miscarriage. If the blood loss is less than the normal menstrual flow, is not accompanied by pain or uterine contraction, and this occurs in about 50% of the cases. The other half may proceed to inevitable or missed abortion. Um, how do you treat a missed abortion? The rest in bed for about a week after uh, is advised just to stop the uh, bleeding. Um, a very important advice that needs to be given to those who are having early pregnancy bleeding is that there should be no intercourse. The reason for this is that intercourse gives a mechanical effect that can lead to uterine contractions and the effect of semen. Semen is like prostaglandins on the uterus and can lead to contractions. Some people may give, be given sedatives if they are anxious. Other uh, interventions include progesterones, uh, such as uh, Primolute Depot, hydroxyprogesterone caprate, which can be given as 250 milligrams twice weekly, uh, especially if you're suspecting uh, progesterone deficiency, uh, but we give it a lot. And progesterone, though, may cause retention of a dead ovum uh, and may lead to a missed uh, abortion. What is an inevitable miscarriage? What is the criterion for that? You have early pregnancy with vaginal bleeding, and when you examine the cervix, you find that the cervix is dilated. The vaginal bleeding normally is worse than a threatened abortion. More cramping occurs and is colicky and radiates to the back, akin to labor pains. No tissues are reported to have been passed yet, and the internal ores of the cervix is dilated, and the products of conception may actually be felt or seen via speculum through it. Ruptured membranes between 12 to 28 weeks is a sign of inevitability, of, uh, of uh, inevitable miscarriage. On ultrasound, the products of conception may be located in the lower uterine segment or in the cervical canal. How do you treat an inevitable miscarriage? Any attempt to maintain the pregnancy is generally not successful. And if the pregnancy is less than 12 weeks, Termination may be done by vaginal evacuation and curettage, or suction evacuation under anesthesia. If pregnancy is more than 12 weeks, then you could use an oxytocin drip given by intravenous, um, an IV drip to try to expel the uterine contents. If a placenta is retained, then it may be removed even under anesthesia. Uh, um, there's a lot of movement towards uh, medical management of uh, uh, miscarriages and therefore a lot of uh, 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 misoprostol uh, is used nowadays, uh, moving away from the traditional uh, surgical evacuation for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, a variety of inevitable miscarriages in which products of conception have been separated from the uterine cavity but retained in the cervical canal uh, and distended is sometimes termed a cervical miscarriage. The patient complains of considerable bleeding and severe low abdominal pain that is referred to the back. The products of conception can be felt through the dilated cervix. So the treatment is to under anesthesia, dilate the cervix and have the contents removed and you could curate uh, the uh, uterine cavity, the cedar. In complete miscarriage, a pregnancy is associated with heavy bleeding, the dilatation of the cervical canal and passage of products of conception. This can either be that the mother has reported or observed and they are intense cramps, and the uterus is less than the period of amenorrhea, but it's still large because not all products of conception have been expelled. Ultrasound shows some products of conception, 
are still in the uterus. And um, any attempt to maintain the pregnancy is not useful. Again, this is treated like an inevitable miscarriage and uh, termination is done by vaginal evacuation or curettage and suction curettage under anesthesia. If the pregnancy is more than 12 weeks, again, oxytocin drip is used to try to expel the uterine contents and placenta may be removed manually under anesthesia. So I alluded to this earlier, uh, medical versus surgical therapy for miscarriages. Uh, the risk for medical therapy, so we are weighing between the two, include bleeding, uh, infection, possible incomplete miscarriage, and a possible failure of the medication to work. Um, the advantage of suction uh, curettage is that the procedure can be scheduled, occurs at a known time, uh, but there are risks of uh, evacuation, which include bleeding, infection, possible perforation, a very important um, um, risk of surgical evacuation. And uh, you could also get what is called Asherman syndrome after the procedure where you overcurate the uterine decidua and you get adhesions between the anterior and posterior walls and it leads to amenorrhea, infertility and uh, other issues. A complete miscarriage, uh, you have a history of vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain and passage of tissues. After the tissue passes, the patient notes that the pain subsides and the vaginal bleeding significantly diminishes. When you examine, you get some, you may get some blood in the vaginal bowl, but the cervical os is closed and there is no tenderness. And the uterus, annexa, and abdomen are all non tender. And when you do an ultrasound, you get an empty uterus. A missed miscarriage, um, you get non viable intrauterine pregnancy that has been retained within the uterus without spontaneous miscarriage for four weeks or more. Uh, Canius mole is an early missed abortion. It's a special variety in which the dead ovum in early pregnancy is surrounded by a clotted blood. There are no symptoms exist except that she, uh, the lady has missed her period and knows that she's pregnant. A fetal heartbeat is not observed or heard at, at the appropriate time and no vaginal bleeding abdominal pain or passage of tissues or cervical changes are present. When you do an ultrasound, you find a fetus with no fetal heart. A late missed miscarriage, you get symptoms of threatened abortion that may or may not have developed. Then the pregnancy symptoms regress. You've seen some people are pregnant, then all of a sudden they, no, they had nausea, vomiting, and breast symptoms, and then this decreased. The abdomen though does not increase and may or actually decrease in size. Fetal movements are not felt um, or they cease if they previously were, were there. Occasionally you get some milk secretion starting, particularly if it's a second trimester miscarriage because the estrogen declined. And uh, these were the ones that were blocking the action of prolactin on the breast. A dark brown vaginal discharge may occur, and the uterus fails to grow uh, or even increase in size. The cervix is closed, and fetal hearts are not hard. So, a pregnancy test becomes negative within two weeks of the ovum death, but it may remain positive for a longer period due to persistent living chorionic villi. Ultrasound may show either collapsed gestational sac, absent fetal heart movements, or fetal movements. Uh, complications of missed miscarriages uh, could, is DIC, disseminated in travascular coagulation, which may occur if a dead conceptus is re re retained for more than a month. And over and above, infection may occur. So how do you treat this? The dead conceptus is expelled spontaneously in a majority of the cases. Evacuation of the uterus is indicated if there is spontaneous expulsion does not occur within four weeks, there's active bleeding or infection or DIC develop, and the patient may also be anxious. So, 
if the uterine size is less than 12 weeks, vaginal or suction evacuation may be done. Oxytoxics, prostaglandins, and a combination of both may be used if the uterine size is more than 12 weeks. We are moving towards medical management even for the ones less than 12 weeks, but we have seen the disadvantage of that uh, earlier on. Hysterotomy is rarely indicated in second trimester missed abortion if the medical uh, induction fails and uh, uh, is repeated several times. A concern and a big concern of for maternal uh, mortality is sepsis following abortion. So a septic miscarriage is any type of abortion uh, uh, that is complicated by infection. The E. coli bacterioids, anaerobic streptococci, clostridia streptococci, and staphylococci are among the most common causative organisms. Um, the client would have pyrexia and tachycardia. Rigors would suggest bacteremia. A subnormal temperature with tachycardia is ominous and would be mostly seen in gas-forming organisms like clostridia. You get malaise, sweating, headache, and joint pain. Some people can progress to jaundice and hematuria, which are ominous signs and um, that indicate hemolysis due to chemi uh, chemicals produced in infection of especially criminal abortions or hemolytic infections such as clostridium. When you examine the abdomen, you get suprapubic pain and tenderness and you can get abdominal rigidity and distension, which may indicate a peritonitis. A vaginal, offensive vaginal discharge may be found. Um, the uterus is tender, the products of conception may be felt, and local trauma may be detected. Fullness and tenderness in the pouch of Douglas would indicate a pelvic abscess that could be associated with uh, diarrhea. You may be complicated by endotoxic septic shock, which is as, which may also result in acute renal failure and disseminated intravascular coagulation (DIC). So you need to isolate the patient and give them bed rest. Put an IV line, and uh, in case of shock, a central venous line to aid control of fluid and transfusions if necessary. Observe vital signs of temperature, blood pressure, as well as fluid intake and urine out. Uh, cervical, a cervical vaginal swab is taken for culture for aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. And you need to start uh, antibiotic therapies. There are various combinations that are used, ampicillin, cephalosporins, plus gentamicin for the gram-negative metronidazole for the anaerobes are given IV while awaiting culture results. Um, clindamycin, gentamicin is another um, uh, regimen that can be used. Fluid therapy is important with 5% uh, normosaline and glucose ring as lactate can be given as long as there is no manifestation of acute renal failure, particularly urine output is more than 30 mils per hour. Uh, oxytocin infusion uh, can be given to control bleeding and enhance expulsion of retained products of conception. Surgical evacuation of the uterus can be done after six hours after commencing IV therapy, but may be done earlier in case of severe bleeding or deterioration of the condition. Hysterectomy may be needed uh, in endotoxic shock that is not responding to treatment, particularly uh, gas gangrene. A concept of recurrent or what is called habitual miscarriage is when you have two uh, uh, or two or more pregnancy, early pregnancy losses. We have gone through the causes of uh, miscarriage and these are, uh, are the same, they are sort of the same. Then, um, Medical treatment for recurrent miscarriage, uh, you need to treat the causes. If we go back to the possible causes, they include chromosomal abnormalities, 
uterine abnormalities, infections, hormonal, immunological, and miscellaneous, such as chronic malnutrition, anemia, cardiac and renal disease, cigarette smoking. So you treat anemia, treat diabetes, treat the renal disease, and treat infections, uh, chlamydia, mycoplasma, and uh, use progesterone for luteal phase defects. So there are anatomical conditions that lead to recurrent miscarriages and uh, some operations on the uterus, such as metroplasty, cervical sacrilege, and treatment of Asherman syndrome and myomectomy may be useful to prevent miscarriages. The advanced places you could get um, IVIG in some patients with loss and cellular immunity anomalies, they may be given intravenous immunoglobulins that may improve pregnancy outcomes. What, what do you do about post-operative, uh, post-abortive bleeding? Uh, this is persistent bleeding that recurs four weeks after a miscarriage. Uh, it could be caused by perforation of the uterus or cervical laceration, retained products of conception, infection that leads to sloughing of septic debris, some mucous myomas or uh, fibroids, choriocarcinoma, local gynecological lesions such as cervical polyps of carcinoma and hemorrhagic diseases and dysfunctional uterine bleeding. It is important to know that a miscarriage is actually a loss to the mother. It's a, the mother has a sense of loss of a baby. So we must never underestimate and say, oh, these are normal miscarriages, so to speak. To the mother, it's a loss of a baby and it's important that they undergo uh, counseling. And units around our uh, facilities should have uh, counselors ready to counsel all mothers who undergo um, a, a miscarriage. As we said, an ectopic pregnancy is a, a very big differential diagnosis for uh, uh, miscarriages. And um, it's good to know the basic features of an ectopic pregnancy and how to distinguish it from a miscarriage. The uterine cavity is empty on ultrasound. Um, the HCG levels, a discriminatory zone is the level of HCG beyond which a normal singleton intrauterine pregnancy is consistently visible by ultrasound. So the discriminatory zone may vary depending on a number of factors, including HCG assays. What they are saying is that there is a level of HCG a value beyond which if you do a HCG level and uh, find that it is 6,000 and you do an um, uh, an ultrasound, an uh, abdominal ultrasound, you're likely to see uh, a fetus in the uterus. If you do not see one, then you suspect an ectopic pregnancy, as long as the HCG is positive. Um, so those are the, some studies recommend a gestational sac would be visualized by 5.5 weeks. A gestational sac could be visualized by HCG level of 1,500 to 2,400 m milli international units per mil, that's for transvaginal, and a level of over 3,000 milli international mil for transabdominal ultrasound. So occasionally there are confusions on is it an ectopic, is it a miscarriage, and the HCG levels can be used uh, to do that. How do you treat an ectopic pregnancy? I think there are surgical and medical management. Um, medical therapy is not very common, but you can use methotrexate. Uh, the dose is 50 milligrams per meter squared, maximum of 100 milligrams. But there's a criterion for treating uh, ectopic pregnancies using methotrexate. A lot of times you do laparoscopy or laparotomy. And if they come uh, with um, hemodynamic instability, then it's a medical emergency. Um, so the prognosis of uh, miscarriages is a risk of Asherman syndrome from the procedures. There's a risk of perforation of the uterus from the procedures and controlled bleeding can occur. And spontaneous 
uh, uh, mothers have been known to die from uh, complications of uh, abortion. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind. An important uh, um, uh, the manual vacuum aspiration is one of the most important interventions of um, uh, miscarriages and um, just to see if people are awake, I would like us to name parts of this kit in the next in the chat box in the next uh, 30 seconds. Can you name parts of the MVA manual vacuum aspiration? I can see some in the picture there. In the chat box. Uh, yeah. There's a barrel cannula. I've seen Ruth Mwangi, valve set, David Muller cannula, cannula, plunger, Isaac Miner. Thank you very much. Syringe, Judith Elavian. I say it's syringe. I think people can see. Ah, Mumekwama. Yes, cylinder cap. Thank you very much, George Ombuak. Cannula, majority no cannula. Zero. O ring, the O ring. Very good. Thank you very much, Bernard Kibeji. Uh, Nancy Wairimo says the, the liner, lubricant, very important, syringe, plunger, valve set, plunger, stopper, very important. Cannula, plunger, cannula. Okay, and I think the cannulas are of a piston, there's violet or classic. Now, the next question is what are the size ranges for the cannulas? Size ranges for the cannulas. We have completed the parts. Let's have what are the size ranges for the cannulas. I think a lot of us are engaged in uh, MVA. This has been trained a lot to the uh, nurses, clinical officers, and the medical officers. Four to 12, four to 12 what? Ruth Mwangi, four to 12 centimeters. Yes, millimeters, I'm seeing there, six to 12, according to George. It's important to have the unit, six, eight, 10, 12, Beverly, Atieno. Thank you very much. I think uh, a lot of you are actually engaged in MVA, very important uh, uh, method. And uh, just to go quickly, I borrowed from the IPAS. Uh, I borrowed from the IPAS how to uh, do an MVA. And um, I normally uh, go to inspect. It's very important to see that the technique is correct and um, if we go quickly through the steps, if you look at the diagram there, then you will see that um, you need to administer pain medication before the procedure. Uh, I think over the years we have been very unfair to our women uh, by not giving uh, pain medication. And I think a basic uh, diclofenac, uh, 75 milligrams as an IM, can also be administered Um, give, you give pre prophylactic antibiotics to all women undergoing the procedures, the women to empty her bladder, very important, conduct a bimanual exam to confirm the uterine size. Inspect using a speculum for signs of infection, bleeding, and incomplete. For those who can, occasionally you can, uh, uh, painkiller, you can do um, antiseptic, you soak it and clean the cervical os. As the picture shows there, and you clean in a spiral outward without going back to where you have cleaned and repeat until the os is completely covered by antiseptic. I have witnessed a lot of MVAs where the antiseptic is not put in Anzanga Kwasha direct. So let's uh, move on. You, for those who can, occasionally you can do a parasurvival block. It's, um, sorry, sorry about that. A parasurvical block is, as the picture shows, you give injection uh, at 12 o'clock and the sites of injection are 2, 4, 8, and 10 o'clock uh, with 20 cc of 1% lidocaine or 10 cc of 2% lidocaine. Inject a small amount into the cervix at those sites, 12, 2, 4, 8, and 10. It is very important to note that the uterine arteries uh, pass the cervix at three o'clock and nine o'clock. Do not inject 
uh, leave no cane at those sites because you will have uh, a, a, a leave no cane emergency in your hands. But that is the anatomy for that. It is useful. Where the cervix is not dilated, you can dilate it. So observe no touch technique when dilating the cervix. And instruments that enter the uterine cavity should not be touch your gloves, the patient's skin, or the women's vaginal walls. And they should be uh, sterile. You can use uh, mechanical dilators to progressively large cannula and gently, remember, gently dilate the cervix to the right size. And um, when the first step of inserting the cannula, when applying traction to the tenaculum, insert the cannula through the cervix just past the os and into the uterine cavity. Now, very important, the cervix traction on the cannula is to align the uterus to the cervix. Remember that the uterus is antiverted or uh, retroverted, meaning that it is at an angle to the cervix. So you must pull the tenaculum to avoid perforations into the rectum and other bowel. Uh, and that's the reason for uh, tagging the cannula. And do not insert the cannula forcefully because it could go through and through once it enter and cause perforations. Then uh, you prepare the aspirator, position the plunger all the way inside the cylinder, have the collar stops in place with the tabs in the cylinder holes, push the valve buttons down and forward until they lock, pull the plunger back until the arms snap outwards to catch the cylinder. It's a very uh, ingenious concept where you create a vacuum and then when the cannulas are inside, you release for the products of conceptions to be sucked in. So suction of the uterine contents, you attach the prepared aspirator to the cannula, release the vacuum by pressing both buttons. Evacuate uh, the uterus by gently and slowly rotating rotating, uh, I see a lot of people doing a lot of uh, going in and out, but it's usually a rotatory action with a slight in and out motion as you rotate the cannula. When the procedure is finished, you depress the buttons and disconnect the cannula from the aspirator. Alternatively, you can withdraw the cannula into the aspirator without depressing the buttons. Uh, how do you know your uterus is empty? You get a red or pink foam without tissue that is seen passing through the cannula. You also get a gritty sensation on the cannula as it passes over the evacuated urine, uterus. Of note is that once you get that gritty uh, sensation, please don't go over and over again. The same thing, that is what causes Asherman syndrome. That gritty sensation shows that that particular area there are no POCs. And now you are bordering on the endometrial cavity. The uterus contracts, you feel it gripping the cannula and the patient may complain a bit of pain, indicating the contraction of the uterus. Then you inspect the tissues, and the products of conception, and um, the tissues may also be seen so that you could also see a molar pregnancy where you see vesicles. And it's important to note the characteristics of that because you may need further treatment in case the, it was a molar uh, pregnancy. Then uh, uh, you can perform any concurrent procedures and reassure the woman that the procedure is finished to ensure she's escorted to the recovery area and process all instruments. Um, I think uh, we are doing well on time. I just want to do a small note on protocols. Uh, we need to generate pathways for our teams to follow easily whenever an early pregnancy bleeding occurs. It can be quite uh, uh, difficult to start processing when you have someone ahead of you who is bleeding in early pregnancy. The pathways would serve as a guideline in our individual units that would allow quick, uniform decision making. Uh, an example, uh, that I borrowed from Queensland Clinical Guidelines is shown uh, below. So that's an example of a pathway that can be put in your um, units where you have a flowchart. So this, this particular flowchart uh, is um, a flowchart that assesses a suspecting suspected early pregnancy loss. You can see the clinical presentation on the one side and uh, 
the main assessment is whether there is hemodynamic stability. If yes, if the patient is not stable, you do resuscitation. If the assessment uh, shows that the patient is hemodynamically stable, you do the assessment, take history, physical examination, do your labs, and yeah. if you confirm pregnancy, you check the location of the pregnancy, and it's important to keep looking for whether it's an uh, ectopic pregnancy or not. If it's an intrauterine pregnancy, you check is the pregnancy viable, yes or no. Um, if not viable, then you uh, initiate the processes of evacuation. And uh, if viable, then you initiate care as has been outlined earlier on. There is also the possibility of gestational trophoblastic disease, and that goes to the management of that. This is another flowchart for assessment of location and viability of early pregnancies. And it's mainly based on um, beta HCG values, and that can always be worked out uh, by your units, individual units. Uh, and this is another flowchart for what to do in an ectopic pregnancy. We know that some ectopic pregnancies, we, if they're unraptured, we can do them as um, non-emergency operations because you know that uh, sometimes the, 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 when you uh, do a laparotomy, you may find more than you bargain for. And if it's unraptured, it can always be done when there are enough staff, when there is highest caliber of uh, personnel and they are the most. Um, those are other flowcharts that show what you do for a, a non-viable intrauterine pregnancy, expectant management, medical management, and surgical management. Very good. I think with that, we have completed and um, we, do we have time? What was the time? 8.26, yeah. I think it's a good time to present that. And we have a 40 year old, very simple, para three plus zero gravida four, who presents with amenorrhea of six weeks. With mild lower abdominal pain, sporting for the last 24 hours. Yeah. So one question maybe in the chat, what history would you want to take from her? Uh, and what test would you ask for? 40 year old. Para three plus four, six weeks amenorrhea, mild lower abdominal pain, spotting. 30 seconds, let's, let me see. What history do you want to take from her? History of chronic illness such as diabetes. History of family planning use, history of family planning use. History of contraceptives, interesting. Family planning, okay. Duration of the pain, yes, important. Blood group, yeah. history of active sexual activity, obsgyne, history of trauma. Very good. Excellent. I think we had passed through, is the pain radiating? Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. So you, what examination would you do for her? We've gotten the history. What examination would you do for her? You do a speculum, yes. Pregnancy tests, correct. Very good exam, pelvic exam, very good pregnancy test. So the pregnancy test is positive. Uh, so the pregnancy test is positive. The speculum, yes, obstetric scan. Very good, very good. I can see people have are awoke. That's the second case now. Um, her pregnancy test is positive and the speculum reveals a clot of blood at the cervix that is closed. The ultrasound reveals a gestational sac equivalent to six weeks and no fetal pole is seen. What is your next mode of management? Yeah, remember, this was our 40-year-old para 3 plus 0 gravida 4 with a menorrhea of six weeks and sporting for the last 24 hours. A pregnancy test is now positive. Speculum shows a clot and the cervix is closed. An ultrasound reveals a gestational sac equivalent to six weeks as shown in the picture and no fetal pole is seen. What is your next mode of management? Explain 
outcome in complete abortion, evacuate the uterus, okay. By manual exam, managers a missed abortion, MVA. Aha. Uh -huh. This is a cervical miscarriage, bed rest, pelvic, repeat scan after two weeks. Thank you, George. DNC, managers missed abortion, bed rest, MVA. Okay. So we have all schools of thought, and this is uh, what we wanted to bring out, that uh, there are different ways of manage, of uh, looking at this issue. Three weeks later, she comes to the outpatient with heavy vaginal bleeding. Her pulse rate is 110 beats per minute. Examination reveals a dilated cervix. What is your diagnosis? How do you manage her? Uh -huh. Managers in complete abortion, that's fine, in complete. Inevitable, thank you, Elijah. Septic, septic, inevitable, excellent, excellent. I see people have been following. Two, two weeks later, she returns to outpatient department with vaginal bleeding. She has a fever of 38 degrees centigrade. She has suprapubic tenderness, vaginal exam, has some foul odor. Her white blood cell is 14 HP, 8.5. What do you do? You remember two weeks? Yeah, manager septic abortion, yes. Manager septic, I don't give antibiotics, septic, I don't manage. Excellent. I think we we all have gotten the concept. Um, if we go quickly through the case presentation, uh, this patient can be diagnosed here as having a threatened miscarriage. And you take all the history that um, we said you take, you examine, and of importance, you want to see the uterine size and uh, the cervix, is it open or not? You ask for a pregnancy test, and the diagnosis will probably be a threatened miscarriage and uh, you could repeat the ultra. Uh, this one, no fetal pole was seen. You could, at this stage, you could actually repeat an ultrasound after two weeks uh, because uh, 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 the gestation of about six weeks uh, and the cervix was closed and the pregnancy test is still positive would mean that uh, there is a possibility of viability and maybe we haven't caught it. So here I would uh, manage it more like uh, repeat after uh, two weeks, an ultrasound scan, which may come positive or negative. If it's non-viable after two weeks, you treat as uh, you treat as uh, least miscarriage and evacuate. If it comes back viable, and we have seen some people who have been told that they are they have no uh, they have no viable fetus and have come back with a viable fetus, and they can talk really badly, saying, "Ah, those people." And then here we have seen that um, uh, this is an inevitable miscarriage and should have been evacuated and treated as an inevitable as the way we go. And this is now an example of a septic miscarriage. You've seen the fever, uh, suprapubic tenderness and the foul odor and the raised white blood cell and anemia. I mean, she has bled and um, these are uh, very good. These are some of my references, and I want to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think we I'll stop sharing my slides and uh, go through some of the questions that may have been asked. Uh -huh. Very good. I, I, I see uh, we had very attentive people. 45X cardiotype is Turner syndrome. The serostatus of patients contribute to miscarriage? Um, not that I know of. I think we have had um, very many uh, people who are seropositive getting uh, babies, but we can always find that out. Is there a difference between spontaneous and inevitable uh, miscarriage? That's what Bernard Kivinji has asked. I think spontaneous means that the pregnancy has come out on its own as opposed to 
determination of pregnancy and uh, inevitable means that the it's a uh, you are having you are pregnant in early and the cervix is dilated so spontaneous and inevitable are not in the same group so to speak spontaneous is as opposed to induced and the inevitable is when the cervix is dilated would you send us a link to download the notes yes this will be uploaded uh, to the youtube page of and i think uh, uh, the equalize health team will send the links to you by close of business tomorrow is there a role of bed rest in management of threat and miscarriage a lot of times we doctors do give bed rest because um we uh, movement per se may may stimulate um, uh, miscarriages but it's also psychologically for the uh, lady who is having a threat and miscarriage is good for them to rest of more importance is to ask them to avoid sexual activity sexual activity can actually uh, make miscarriage faster uh, but uh, strictly speaking bed rest has uh, is not uh, scientifically shown to improve so to speak uh, or decrease the rate of miscarriages uh, can misoprostol be used as an alternative to oxytocin drip in more than 12 weeks yes we have used uh, misoprostol uh, for miscarriages even up to 20 weeks and it can actually be used as an alternative. Can big ovarian cyst cause miscarriage in someone who is pregnant? Um, I'm not too sure about that, but uh, we have seen ovarian cysts hand in hand with pregnancies. So I'm not too sure about how that, um, not necessarily. Which sedatives can be used in threatened miscarriage? Actually, a lot of times we do not use sedatives. Um, there, uh, it was a tradition a long time ago where a lot of phenobab, uh, phenobabitone was used, but nowadays we do more of progesterone than uh, sedation. But if a mother is excessively uh, worried, then uh, there is no harm in uh, using sedatives although we do not use them a lot nowadays can misoprostol be used to a client with previous scars uh, misoprostol can be used in cases of miscarriage because we normally say it has not reached the age where the lower uterine scar has formed um i Previously, my lower limit was 24 weeks, but I have now lowered it to 22 weeks because um, we have had of some uh, uterine rupture at 24 weeks while managing with misoprostol for uh, inevitable or for missed, missed abortions. Is, is there a role of calcium channel blockers in second trimester threatened miscarriage. Um, they have been used, but their main use is uh, the progesterone. A lot of progesterones are used in early trimester, but calcium channel blockers are mainly used in the third trimester. Calcium channel blockers are medicines like mifedipine which are uh, reported to uh, knock off labor, so to speak. They are mainly used in third trimester. Is Kanya's mole uh, same as Hydra TD for mole? No, a molar pregnancy is a normal pregnancy. A Kanya's mole is a normal pregnancy with a halo of blood. How long do you wait to do an evacuation for a septic abortion? I think we went through that. If someone is bleeding heavily, you can do it immediately. You, you can wait, then you can give antibiotics to allow the antibiotics to circulate. And six hours later, you can do um, evacuation. 
racers negative blood as a cause of uh, miscarriage. Racers uh, negativity is not a cause of miscarriages, but it is important to give anti D for racers negative mothers who have had a miscarriage, especially in second trimester. In septic uh, uh, miscarriage, is there a standard rate of infusion or is it titrated in response? I think it is titrated in response. Is there a role for antibiotic prophylaxis where one is worried about septic miscarriage? Uh, yes, there is a role for that. Uh, we went through that. Pain medication is very important. Judy Chwea has said uh, that uh, pain medication is very important for MVA. And I agree with her uh, that pain, uh, an MVA is very painful. And definitely uh, we need to give uh, pain medication. For how long and how much progesterone do we administer? Uh, and this is dependent. Some people, you can continue with the progesterone as long as bleeding continues. Some people, you can stop if bleeding stops. If you continue for about a week and bleeding stops, you can continue. And there are various regimens for different progesterones. Um, Can one uh, insert an IUD after delivery? Uh, there is a study that was done by Kenya Obstetrics Gynecological Society and Postpartum in IUD, and they say that uh, you can. There are studies to that. Uh, good, I think uh, I have covered uh, a lot of the questions, unless there is a burning question. Um, very good question here. And uh, we have encountered it while doing an MVA and a patient bleeds excessively. What are you supposed to do? Uh, if a patient is bleeding while an MVA, that, that may mean several things. One, the uterus is not contracted as a result of uh, still having retained products of conception. That means you may not have completed the evacuation. And um, so a lot of times completion of removal of all products of conception, the treatment. Secondly, you may also look, um, ensure that they are not having bleeding, uh, a bleeding tendency, like uh, pathologies, like a bleeding disorder, so to speak like DIC or um, platelets are low and that. But the main one is usually retained products of conception. And it's important, you could add misoprostol, uh, misoprostol like uh, six tablets, uh, three, 600 milligrams to 800 milligrams and they could swallow. And uh, um, uh, bleeding during an MVA can actually be very brisk. A lot of bleeding also occur uh, in um, uh, especially what is called uh, a missed abortion. Missed abortions can be big. And it is advisable that before you do an MPA that you have actually primed the mothers with misoprostol a few hours earlier, both at the vaginal level and uh, they could also swallow the medicine because the bleeding can actually be very heavy. Okay. I think with that, I can hand over to um, the Equalize team. Thank you so much, Dr. Simon. Uh, thank you, everyone. We will go through any additional questions and uh, we'll share it with you, sir. Uh, uh, so that prop maybe we can create a document out of it and share it with all the participants on the most relevant questions asked. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. We uh, have another session on uh, on Wednesday now.
So uh, see you all on Wednesday. We'll be sharing uh, the recordings of this session. We'll be putting it in the dashboard for you to refer it whenever you want. And uh, uh, you can access all other sessions as well there. Uh, for any questions that you may have, you can uh, reach out to us, uh, reach out to the number from which you're getting uh, the WhatsApp reminders or email it to us directly. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Simon, for that uh, really uh, enlightening session and uh, see you all uh, on Wednesday. So wish you all a very good night. Good night. Bye, everyone.